still have past 12. All right, uh, let's proceed. My name is Peter Seto. I am the Chief Executive of Vumelana Advisory Fund. With me here is Brian Whitaker. He's one of the directors of Vumelana. Chair, right at the outset, we really wish to um, thank you and the committee for having afforded us an opportunity to come and actually make this oral presentation to share with you our experiences. <clears throat> we have circulated the our presentation, really, the first slide really deal with uh, an overview of what we've covered and I'm not going to spend much time on. Vumelana is a non-profit public benefit organization established in 2011 to support South Africa's land reform program. Our entire interest is, is really in the success of land reform in South Africa. Our perspective on the necessity of and the mechanisms for expropriating land without compensation is really based on our practical experience of having supported the building of partnerships in this space for, for land reform. Since our inception, we've had to deal with in excess of 300 inquiries from uh, different players. We are currently dealing with in excess of about 26 communities around the country and we are supporting projects in agriculture, tourism and forestry. There's in excess of about 29 private companies and investors that we are currently dealing with. Our interventions have had a potential to really bring in excess of just close to 600 million in investment, over a thousand jobs, and impact positively on just under 14,000 households. Chair, we submit that uh, government should proceed with caution when considering an amendment to the constitution to accelerate land reform. Because, in our view, to focus on the constitution as the key impediment to successful land reform is to misdiagnose the problem. A misdiagnosis of the problem will divert attention from the matters that really require urgent attention. And we also believe that a failure to deal with matters that require urgent attention will compound the difficulties of land reform, slow progress, and fuel rising dissatisfaction as we've seen in the recent times. Whilst there are several challenges to successful land reform, we wish to highlight a few which in our view really require most urgent attention. And I'll quickly run through this. There's a lack of consensus on the need for land reform. And our view is that if you've got broader support from, from all the role players and stakeholders, the program could actually move more swiftly. There's also uncertainty about what land reform should really achieve and how the results should be measured while acknowledging that there's, uh, dim there's while acknowledging both urban and rural dimensions. There's also been insufficient attention to the manner in which land is used, including implementation delays. We also have inefficient restitution processes. We also have lack of transparency and clarity particularly when it comes to redistribution procedures, and these are the issues that, in our view, needs to be addressed. There is lack of attention to tenure reform. Of the three branches of land reform, uh, tenure reform has been the least addressed, even though a high proportion of South Africans live under unsecured tenure in former homelands. Policies that inhibit access to finance for land reform beneficiaries remain a key challenge that we need to address as South Africans. Insufficient resources and limited institutional capacity, particularly within the state, also needs to be addressed if you are to make any meaningful dent or progress in the land reform space. Chair, we have summarized 10 key actions that we strongly believe that we need to embark upon as, as a nation if we are to accelerate land reform. We have dealt with these 10 key actions in detail in our written submission. We've also detailed our experience to date through life examples in terms of projects that we've supported. And I will not touch on this, and I'm hoping that uh, members can go through that, and we are more than willing to take questions on those. We, as a starting point, 
We need to encourage all to acknowledge the impact of dispossession and to commit to reform, to ensure that we can have a shared vision that sustains commitment. Secondly, we need to affirm property rights, the rule of law, and just and equitable compensation. Thirdly, it's our view that we need to clarify what land reform should achieve, acknowledging that there are both rural and urban dimensions, and measure progress systematically. While land reform has multiple broad social objectives, Chair, there is a need for a clearer policy priorities and clarity on how we will measure progress. We need to balance concern for acquisition with effective use of the land. The current debates have unfortunately been focusing largely on acquisition, but there's been much, much less really focus on what happens after that land has been uh, secured or transferred. And this, this, in our view, has been largely ignored. And, and in our experience, well-structured partnership would actually support productive use of land as we've said, based on the projects that we've supported over the last couple of years, partnerships have succeeded where government has actually um, not or had limited success. So we, we, we strongly believe that there's, there's a lot that we can learn from this. We also need to streamline the rest restitution process. We must have clear systems so that we are able to resolve disputes and manage complex claims. We, by way of an example, have got a number of projects that we are supporting, especially uh, high-value claims, where you find that um, a claim was made 20 years ago and it hasn't been resolved. And if you zoom into what seems to be the challenges, you find that there has been intra-community dispute and poor administration is being driven, and these matters are being throw, driven through the courts. And our view is that uh, we need to make sure that we introduce some alternative proper alternative dispute resolution mechanisms and also make sure that we regulate these uh, communal property institutions so that we can start ensuring that there are some uh, efficiencies. We need to make the redistribution program more transparent, for example, so that uh, South Africans should know how to apply for, for, for this as part of this redistribution program. How is land, for example, made available? The criteria for making this land available, etc., as well as grant allocation. We also need to make sure that we resolve the conflicts that are associated with tenure reform. I think the previous presenters did allude to the fact that this is one complex area. It really affects communal areas, farm laborers, and the MN poor. This is one area that we really need to deal with. We need to improve post-settlement conditions. The return of land without other factors of production prevents land from being used productively. This factor was further noted as an impediment by, in the diagnostic report prepared by the high-level panel. Projects need capital, skills, governance, organization, and management support in order to succeed. We also need to develop innovative mechanisms for financing land reform because without access to capital, projects will continue to fail. And there's just a limitation on the government fiscals. For us to expect that through government fiscals we'll be able to deal with land reform, I think it's gonna take us quite a long time. We also need to increase the capacity of the state, lastly, to address the institutional weaknesses that are actually impeding land reform. Expropriating land without compensation, in our view, will not address the key institutional impediments to land reform, nor will it advance the actions required to accelerate land reform. The challenge now is to clarify the conditions under which expropriation without com compensation may apply and start the hard bargaining and compromises that are needed in order to accelerate land reform. In our view, we need to define those circumstances in which uh, expropriation without compensation may apply, and those defined circumstances could cover, amongst others, unused land or land acquires by illegal means, uh, land acquires, for example, through state grants, land, for example, developed with large state subsidies and absentee landlords, etc. Compensation must be based on just and equitable principle, accepting that in certain instances, zero may be justified. 
Most importantly, it's our view that uh, this, in one of form or another, has to be determined by the courts. And the application should really be limited to land reform and, and, and focus on restitutions, security of tenure, and redistribution. We, will, we also need national legislation which would really set out the procedures, the powers of the state, rights of landowners and beneficiaries, and this should be subject to some form of judicial review. As I've said, we need to start hard bargaining and compromise is needed if we are to have successful land reform. And in this regard, all role players have got a role to play. For landowners, we need to start negotiating with government and communities, uh, uh, prospective new owners for the finalization of land claims. For financial institutions, we need to negotiate terms on which finance to finance land reform properties and the provision of working capital for, land, for new landowners. Traditional authorities as well negotiate the land rights of families living under the former homelands. Government has to increase the resources available for land reform. We need to release state land for urban and rural development. We need to, most importantly, streamline procedures for processing restitution claims and make process of redistribution more transparent. Municipalities, same uh, Thank applies. you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I've, I've basically concluded. Okay, all right. Um, members? <coughs> yeah. Honorable Korenov, Honorable Cody, uh, Honorable Mente. All right, let's go. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I, I hardly got anything to add. I just want to thank you, and I w really want to say and Mr. Kaskovadia sitting at the back from Busa. This is a very, very well-balanced uh, uh, presentation. If you look at your second last page, you know, it's, it's summing up in a sense where we are and where we should go. Um, but I, I just want to thank you for that. Hello, uh, Cody. <coughs> thank you, comrade uh, Chair. I, I was listening very attentively and also trying to read through the through the presentation. Um, maybe it's because we're moving towards lunch, but I was really I I just could not hear you talking from the perspective of those who. Um, who are impatiently looking forward to accessing land to rebuild their lives. I just didn't. And, you know, when you, I think it's your second page, yeah, second page, where you're talking about papers, the fact that you could actually include a line that say, there is a lack of consensus on the need for reform, that you would consider putting that line in your presentation means that your, your argument or debate starts from a very, very right-wing, almost a reactionary a line. And when I look at the names of the people who constitute your board, I'm just, I'm just dumbfounded how we could start from from that angle because i don't hear i don't i don't hear the those of us who are fortunate to to live better uh, acknowledging that there are millions out there who who have not made it into the party and there is there there has to be a sense of agency to try and and alleviate their conditions without without following the formula that is set by those who already have. I think that, that's what was really eating away inside me that I don't, I don't hear you, I don't feel it. It's, yeah, I think, I think that's what I can say. Um, <laughs> I wish I was more hopeful. No remente. Okay, Chair. Firstly, you, you speak of the 10 key actions to accelerate land reform. 
and none of them speak to a new direction. All of them, they speak to everything else that has been done and failed. And secondly, you are bringing all the conflated administrative issues to the amendment, of which the key issue here we are dealing with, with the amendment of the Constitution, and expropriate without compensation. What we seek to get then from anyone who comes here is to not bring us everything else that has been done and failed. It's not helping us at all. And secondly, when you are saying expropriation of land without compensation will not address the key institutional impediments to land reform, <coughs> nor will it advance the actions required to accelerate land reform. What do you mean? Because everything else that you have said here in your presentation in particular, your 10 key actions that are presumed, they are the direction for your, for your uh, presentation here at this committee. But they fail to give us any new direction and there's nothing else. I, I want to check with you why you must we still consider this when it has all failed. Thank you. Hello, Swart. Jay, I just want to join my colleague, Mr. Kuno, for commending you for your input. And in fact, you deal with some very substantive issues and you highlight certain deficiencies of the past and you commit yourself, you say, in order to accelerate land reform and you make positive suggestions. Here you say the government should use the constitutional measures that are available to it and streamline legislation where required as indicated by the high-level panel. So it's not a question of just rehashing what has existed up to now. If these measures are introduced, we could see faster land reform within the existing constitutional framework. So Chair, from my side, I welcome the issue, but what makes it more persuasive is your experience on this issue that you have been and you are established to support South Africa's land reform program. So you are not speaking in a vacuum. You are speaking from practical experience. And we know that the full parameters of the existing Section 25 have not been fully implemented or applied by the, or, or clarified by the Constitutional Court. So I would ask you just this one issue of post-support measures that you have experienced and the budgetary constraints in that regard for emerging farmers and other persons of need of, of property. Is that one of the focuses that you've experienced as a problem? Thank you. Uh, you see, Mr. Soto, you see what lies ahead uh, in the committee. <laughs> between the two views here, those who see something and those who don't see something. So uh, it would be interesting going forward when the committee debates. So over to you to answer. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Chair. I would like to give over to my colleague to answer some of the questions and I'll deal with the remaining ones which he would not have touched. Over to you, Brian. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, so, uh, Chairman, I'll just try and take them quickly a as they've come. Uh, please don't interpret the point about a lack of consensus as some doubt in our own minds about this. We are committed to land reform. It's all we do. That was the reason for us being started. If we had the consensus we need to move forward, I suggest we might not be here today. We're, we're here because things we don't have a clear enough national vision on this, so please, please take it uh, in in that spirit. In the sense of, you know, the the, the voice of the people. Where are the people in all of this? Uh, we can only speak to you on the basis of what we've experienced in trying to make this project of land reform work. And what we hear from the people we work with is they want their rights to be real. 
Make our rights real, they tell us. When we go onto a farm and you discover this was an operating farm, it might have employed a hundred people and you're sitting under a tree and you're talking to five people and you're saying, what has happened? Where are the people gone? They say they've, they've gone. And, and there's no point in giving us something. In particular, the issue of transferring the land and then preventing us raising the capital, preventing us using the networks to use this land, make the rights real, is what, is what we hear. On the question of, you know, there's, this is not a new direction. It is just about indicating uh, the difficulties that we've experienced. The heart of our submission is, you know, we, we mimic the, the doctors in this, and that is that we have to try to make the right diagnosis. And from the perspective we are sitting at, if we make the diagnosis that all of the difficulties we see arise from the constitution, we will not cure the ills of this patient. Our experience is that they are these issues that are currently causing us the difficulties, and our fear is that when this process is completed, even completed with an amendment to the Constitution, these difficulties will remain. And that is what we want to, want to try to address. In respect of, of, you know, I think the question is, where do we actually stand, <laughs> as you've asked so many people on this, on this, this, this question of, 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 of expropriation without compensation? I think if we divide this into the three parts, on expropriation, if you were to ask us, we would say, yes, we think expropriation is likely to be required in order to complete the land reform program successfully. There will undoubtedly be cases where the state will have to use those powers. On compensation, should land be expropriated without compensation, we would say in cases where that is determined to be just and equitable, and that the courts uphold that to be the case, that should then be the case, based on justice and equity. On the matter of the Constitution, it is our lay opinion that it's not necessary to change the Constitution in order to take the actions that need to be taken. But we think there's a caution here. We are not constitutional lawyers, and it, we don't want to pretend expertise we don't have. It strikes us that at the end of the day, the question of whether the Constitution needs to be changed is a matter of constitutional law. So we don't want to overreach ourselves. Uh, on, on, on that matter. I think that deals with... Um, we checked, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry Chair, I think there was one... Conclude. Yeah. All so. right. I think there was one specific question from Honorable Swart pertaining to post-settlement support. I mean, this is one part, this is one area which um, I think we need to seriously address as a country. As Vumelana, our experience having worked on a number of projects is, our experience is that uh, when you really give people the land without giving them formidable support so, so that they are able to put their land to productive use, that really creates problems. It disempowers them. So based on the projects that we've, we've done, starting from ensuring that we put together commercial arrangements in place, ensuring that you make um, appropriate, you, you get the right um, commercial partners to, to partner with them, to ensure that you improve on the governance. Because our experience, particularly with communities, if the first few, um, you know, monies trickle into the bank account, particularly if there are no proper governance processes, if there's no transparency, invariably you have infightings amongst the community. So uh, assisting them to improve on their governance is really key. So this is one area that we've done a lot of work on. Organizational and management support is one area that we've done, that we've actually been assisting them. From assisting them to develop policies, to ensuring that they can establish a proper, appropriate vehicles for running their businesses, to setting up communities' trust if, if required, negotiation of shareholder arrangements, lease agreements, etc. And most importantly, to make sure that they are able to, from time to time, have annual general meetings. They can have their financials actually audited, etc. We find it that in those projects where we've supported communities to a point where they are able to do this, there is more sanity, there are less infightings, and we find it that private investors are more 
interested to actually come and to the party and actually assist these, these communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. We take the opportunity to thank Vumelana, uh, Advisory Fund, for the presentation before the committee. We certainly have been enriched. Thank you very much. Um, members, you need 10 minutes. Will that be enough? All right, well, let's break for 10 minutes. <clears throat> All right. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs>